going on, LA, my USC fans, alumni, associates, everyone that is down with the Cardinal and Gold. This is Frosty Rucker on the Take Back the West podcast, only on the Believe Network. Today is the day after the day after. We're 2-0. and So yeah, let's get a round of applause. We're all 2-0. and You can go to work or do your Zoom meetings and all that. We're 2-0. and A lot of highs and lows of this game. We're going to talk about them today. And we got a special guest. We got Scott Schrader. He's the head analyst of uscscoop.com, and he's come to take a peek under our hood and see what we got going on with our football program. So stay tuned. This is going to be a good one, and holla at you later. Hello, Trojans. This is Frosty Rucker on the Take Back the West podcast. Catchy name, right? Because we're taking back the West. Um, We're here on the Believe Network. Uh, This podcast is sponsored by betonline.ag. That's where you can place your prop bets, uh, anything you see out there. I'm not a big betting guy, but I dabble every once in a while. So go to betonline.ag and place your bets today. So what's going on, Scott? This is Frosty Rucker. I'm not sure if we've ever met. Maybe so. I don't know. I probably had CTE at some point in my career. So, <laughs> well, I, you know, I don't think we did because I you asked we were talking about before we started recording this on how long I've been doing this, and and I actually got involved when my dad decided to kind of end his time. He was about in his early 80s, and he would cover USC football mm-hmm. recruiting and so on. But uh, I started about the time Pete Carroll got to USC, so that that was a good time. That was a good time to start. Yeah, same here. <laughs> <laughs> and you're getting a late start on all this stuff because you you played too long in the NFL. I mean, what a career! Right, right. No, I'm very fortunate, very blessed to uh, have the foundation set at USC to how to work and how to be a pro. And uh, you know, I took it from there and just kept playing. And uh, a lot of my friends and teammates have gone on second part of businesses and things like that. And I'm just now getting my feet wet, so to say. So, yeah. Well, so yeah, so I got, I got started around 2002 and I was just strictly covering recruiting probably for the first 10 years of, of doing this. I was just going to mostly Southern California guys and USC players um, that they targets they were going after. So um been doing this now. It's, it's going on about 18 years. So um I've had my own site for, for it's going on about four years now, uh, uscscoop.com. And so we cover the, the, the football teams, the basketball teams. I, I like to go to track events and we try and cover as much as we can. Uh, and then the recruiting aspect of it, we're really heavily involved in that. So, you know, for, for, for fans, we kind of cover the broad spectrum of, of USC football. So that's kind of what we do. Yeah, you guys do a phenomenal job. Again, that's uscscoop.com. And I am talking to the head analyst here. Scott Schrader. Uh, Scott, I want to dive into this a little bit uh, about this football team, this COVID-6 season, as I like to call it. Uh, what's the most intriguing thing about this team for you? Well, you know, I, I would say before the season began, you know, I think the, the most intriguing part for me was, was the off-season uh, um, additions to the defensive side of, of the ball for USC, the coaches, entire new coaching staff. Brought in Todd Orlando, Craig Niver, Dante Williams, Victor Oto. Um, who am I missing here? And then and, and Coach Schneider for special teams. Yes. So I, I think you know, in looking at last season and maybe the year before that, could could even be as long as Clancy Pendergast was at USC. Just seemed like they they underperformed defensively. And last year they were ranked a hundred a hundredth. I mean, can you imagine USC? <laughs> I can't, and that's why we're here talking about it. Now. Yeah. So <laughs> so you know. I think that was the most intriguing part for me was to see can Todd Orlando and his staff come in and complement what seemingly was going in the right direction offensively. You know, it's a lot different offense than USC, you know, as as fans and and everybody's used to seeing, but it looked like an offense that was going to put points on the board and and it it, it looked far better than it had in previous years. So that was the most intriguing part, part for me. Now, you know, as the season has started, you know, what are the challenges of, of bringing a new, new defensive coordinator, not having a spring to, to work on this, and a limited, you know, four to five weeks to, to get these guys ready. So, as you know, you, you know it's, it's hard to replicate those intense reps if you're not having any in the springtime. So, it's, it's, we're just seeing if they can catch up and if the mistakes start, you know, the mistakes have been the first couple of games. Red zone, you know, USC is getting the ball inside the 20 yard line and not, not just not getting a touchdown, they're not getting field goals two right. times inside the five yard line at Arizona and no points. So they have to figure out a way how to score 
And I think that's the most intriguing part uh, for me, the, the remainder of the way, is it looks like the offense is moving the ball, but they're not putting points on the board. Yeah, it looks like stat-wise they're doing what they need to do, even if it's late in the game and they're scoring points. And yeah. Some of the questions I've been getting in my email, and obviously, frankly, watching the games, it makes me question, this is a pass-first offense. They have three or four great backs that could, you know, lead any team, it seems like, if they got 30 carries a game. Yeah. But to you, do you think they're trying to get Slovis uh, comfortable and get him in a rhythm first? Or that's the most dynamic thing they want to do first? Or that's just the way this offense is? If they see it, they pass it, and that's just it. Is it script? I, I, I think it's more of what you just said last. I, uh, I, if, if you look at Graham Harrell when he was at North Texas, um, you know, last year was, was kind of an aberration because uh, all the running backs got hurt. So you were left with a true freshman at running back. And, you know, I, I have my conversations with the guys on, on XM series about this and, and um, you know, they're like, well, you you should be able to pound the ball. I'm tired of hearing excuses, injuries, this, this, and whatever. But, you know, I think you, you have to look at when you have three injured running backs and you're down to a true freshman, um, you know, you're probably going to throw the ball more often than, than you, than you run. But this year, everybody's healthy. And, you know, if you look at North Texas, I'll go back to that. When Graham was there, they were almost a 50, 50 pass pass run so I think you're just kind of seeing what the USC offense could you know was probably going to be last year a little bit later and you know it looks like the running game could be pretty solid again you know they put the ball on the ground three times in the last game you know one time at the one yard line and and, and another time inside the 15 yard line um, so I, I think the running game is, is to me anyway has, has looked better and it looks very promising so I'm not really sure, you know, why they would run the ball first or pass the ball first. I think, you know, I'm not qualified to be an offensive coordinator. But, you know, but again, you know, we all watch football, right? So, you know, if you watch it long enough, you played long enough, you've, you've been around a lot of talented offensive players, coaches, and so on. So, I, you know, I'm not really quite sure of that dynamic. But, uh, you know, the offense to me doesn't look, you know, it looks maybe out of rhythm a little bit. I'm not quite sure, you know, what's going on with not being able to get in one yard you know, as right, often right. As, if they can't. But, uh, you know, if that continues and the mistakes continue, it, you know, it's going to be hard to win the rest of the football games. You know, Scott, honestly, I love to see the coaches keep going for it for fourth and one and whatnot. That, that just shows as a player the supreme confidence that he has in that group that yeah. we should be able to get in. And sometimes it just feels like maybe if they were in I formation and ran a power of a sort, it would be yeah. more, you know, decisive and, you know, we're going to get that yard. But when they're running zones and whatnot and, you know, everyone's going sideways, uh, defense linemen have been penetrating two weeks straight and they're just coming up short in those. And for, for one side of me, it's like continue to do that because you keep the defense, the coordinator on their toes, the defense, they don't know to run uh, pump block out there or stay on there and defend. They don't know how soft it is. But it's another time, yeah. it's like, you know, sometimes just punt it. You know, or you know what I'm saying? Just punt the ball, sure. back them up, let the defense have some, some room, and then work the short fields because we keep getting the ball. With, you know, they get down there in short field, but then they can't punch it in. So, yeah. you know, I think this is what we're seeing is a little bit of not having those valuable reps in a fall camp, uh, off-season programs and whatnot. And, you know, the question mark coming into this was defense – but now it seems like it's shifting to offense. Yeah. I, I mean, it has, after two games, I think, I think defensively, you know, USC's kind of hurting a linebacker right now. And, and you know, they, they, they've got talented linebackers, but, you know, one of their fifth-year seniors, Jordan Yosepa, out for the season, a, a promising kid who hasn't played for a while, and, and, and Solomon Tuliapupu, you know, he wasn't able to play. Now you got Palaia and now Teote. Um, who's got a really, really swollen and, and, and his, his left leg doesn't look good. So, um, but defensively, I'm, I'm looking at the defense and I'm actually watching it. I'm watching my, I shoot video during the game. So I kind of, I watch it afterwards to see what, what I really saw. The defense looks very promising. That defensive line looks pretty active and, and pretty solid. Um, so, you know, defensively, I think it's doing, but offensively, you know, how there's also a lot of fans are saying, why can't it, and including including myself, a lot of people in the media, why can't you just line up under center like you would have with Carson Palmer, Matt Leiner? Right. I don't remember you guys ever getting stuffed on fourth and one, to be quite honest with you. Maybe versus Texas. Okay. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. You had to bring that up, didn't you? I had There's to. There's going to be a lot of people I watching this. I have to. This is one of those <laughs> I things that I remember, right, <laughs> vividly. I, I, I feel you on that one. Man, that was – yeah. in the end, that was one of the greatest college football games I've ever seen. 
I'm reminded every year, and I'm the one that gets posterized every year. But nope, let's, okay. stay, let's stay on yeah. topic. Okay, here. we'll stay on topic. No, we're not going to dive down my, my, my pains and sorrows. Um, this time. Th yeah, this time. So the defense does look better. I'll say that they are well coached at defensive line. Those guys are being very active. They've been very strong and physical, and that's one of the things going into the season we want to see as a fan and, you know, an outsider looking in. We yeah. want to see how they matched up, how they really competed. And that's the thing that we harped on when I was playing is how you compete and how dominant you can be. And it feels like at times, I will say three-quarters of the game, they're just like that. They're lights out. They run the ball. They're physical. And I can tell there's a new energy there. Um, we do give up a lot of pass interference calls. At the same time, I don't mind because I do want my defensive backs more aggressive. Because yeah. in years past, it seemed like the defensive backs wouldn't come up and tackle. Uh, they wouldn't do this. There was always critiques, but they're challenging now. So I think this will mold, and they will get a lot better and stronger through this next three three games they have, or four? Four. And, and through this We're next hoping, four games right? that they have. Right. Uh, I think they'll be better. It's good to see Todd's defense come into form. Uh, they do give up some plays. Uh, you know, running quarterbacks has given them issues. I can go back to my days. They're always going to give you issues, right? I know. But, yeah. Um, yeah, for the most part, I am pleased with the defense. It's just the offensive side of the ball for some reason that, you know, we all have these high hopes that we're scoring 50 points a game. Mm -hmm. you know, school was coming back, sophomore year, maybe a Heisman, you know, yeah. all these accolades, you know, a lot of good energy. Um, but they just haven't done it yet. Again, I'm a Trojan fan. I'm a Trojan. I'm all for them. This is a Take Back the West podcast, so this is no shade. We just want to see them do better, right? Yes. Well, yeah, it's, it's, and, and, and that's you look at the first two games, and I, I, just, I, I actually had a conversation. And, and you know, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of reasons to go back to, to the Pete Carroll years at, at times when he first started. And, you know, there was a, the last game against Arizona State and, and this game against Arizona – you know, I, I just remember that in 2001, you guys went up to Oregon and Washington and lost last second field goals, you know, against number four and number two ranked team or number four, and number six, you know, highly ranked teams on the road. Yes, sir. And you guys were finding ways to lose games. And then against ASU in 2002, you guys found a way to come back and win a game. And I think, you know, the one thing you can say about this football team these, these last two weeks is that. I mean, they, it wasn't easy, but they found a way to come back and win games. They probably, this is just my opinion, probably would have lost the last couple of years. Scott, let's, let's touch on recruiting. Obviously, to build this program back to, to be completely dominant and to compete for rings and championships and Rose Bowl appearances and wins, the recruiting has to be the nucleus of all of this. Yep. The guys that we have coming in for these next classes, do you think they are the five stars that we need, or do you think – we still need to dive in other states and get more players. I, I think uh, if, if you look at the recruiting rankings the last couple of years, USC has not done you know what what they normally uh, do. I mean, this last year they had a really really small recruiting class, only twelve or thirteen guys. But I do think that the guys they did get in the last recruiting class that you'll see in the next couple of years, USC's offensive line will go from being one of the worst in the Pac-12. To, to being one of the best. I think they got a lot of really, really good guys, like future NFL guys for sure. And, and in and the year before, they, they loaded up with, with some, you know, some big uh, cornerbacks. They're doing the same thing in this class. I think USC, again, is going to go on defensively from one of their weakest spots in the defensive backfield, I think will become one of their strengths. And so I do think in this particular recruiting class right now, the class of 2021, kids that haven't signed yet, I think you're going to find that this is going to be a, a very, very, very pivotal recruiting class. I think there's a lot of guys that are highly ranked that I think are, are deserving of it. And there's a lot of guys that are kind of underrated. And, you know, I go out and I go see all the guys in person. So I'm not, I'm not relying on just seeing huddle and, and seeing some <laughs> seven on seven stuff and, and whatever, you know, and you get to know the personalities because that matters as well. Um, do these guys, will these guys fit in at USC, especially USC is going heavy into Texas right now yeah. because they have so many ties. It's stupid not to. You know, because there are guys in Texas right now that you're not going to find in California, and USC has an opportunity to go get those guys. I think both running backs are going to come from Texas um, in this recruiting class. Both are in this offense are just perfect. Okay. Um, they can run. They're strong. They're smart guys, and they can catch passes. So um, I, I, I do think USC's direction they're going right now, they have a lot of really good recruiters on the staff. 
very, very impressive. Absolutely. Um, so I think the direction of that is, is, is going in a very positive way. Yeah, the, you touched on the recruiting. I had Dante Williams on here before and uh, touched on yeah. him being able to come back home as an L.A. kid and uh, being able to, you know, get out there. And obviously he comes with the, uh, the persona of being the nation's best recruiter. Um, we haven't had recruiting like this since, you know, Coach Ed Ordrone or Kenechi Udesi. Um, now I think there's a ring about SC about returning back to the glory days and uh, returning mm -hmm. back to dominance. And um, I love the way the coaching staff has taken that energy on. And you can just really see it. The recruits, when I was in the locker room last year, um, you know, it, it felt kind of tough, though. You know, like we, we weren't the best team but we're still going after some of these top tier guys and then seeing yep. some of the guys not sign, it was disheartening. But then as this off season came, we signed new coaches. Our recruiting classes are getting better. They're going after guys that are five stars and I'm seeing them on there. I'm like, Oh, this guy is highly ranked. This is highly ranked. And they're getting these guys that can build a foundation for us to succeed when Slovis is gone and the next guy's up, we're really going to have a squad. So I really like seeing, I like what the, the direction they're going. The highs and lows of this season so far, obviously we're 2-0. I'm, I'm jazzed about it despite the deficiencies that we do see in the offense or giving up big plays on defense. The guys have battled. They're 2-0. So, obviously, there's always a hot seat, and Coach Helton's always the hot seat. Me, I'm not too frowned upon the guy. I, I actually think the kids love him. I think they play for him. They play hard for him. But when you, you get in these message boards or, you, you know, you're on Twitter or you're – you're listening to ESPN, everyone's so down on coach. Yeah. Me personally, I felt like these first two wins, A, offense, you got Graham Harrell. Let him coach. I don't think Coach Helton has anything to overtake, step in and say, no, don't go for it for fourth and one. He gives the keys to Graham Harrell and let him do what he's supposed to do. I think these first two games defensively, it's a fill out to see how Coach Orlando coaches. What's he going to call? How's he going to fill? What, you know, what pressures he's going to bring? I don't understand why Coach Helton is getting so much slack and they're 2-0. Can you fill me in? Why, why do you feel that way? It's just, you know, it's been even, even when they won the Rose Bowl. You know, it's, well, they only won because of Sam Darnold. Well, I mean, every team wins because of the players, you know, and so if you're, if you're bringing up, they only, but then Ohio State only won because of their quarterback. And, and right. Burroughs was the reason. And it's, you, you can have that argument with everybody. But I don't, there's just been a decline. It's just, I don't think USC fans have ever been happy with Clay Helton being the head football coach for whatever reason. Um, and so I, I think there, you're, you're going to always find reasons why they should fire Clay Helton. And I'm not saying they're not even, there's not valid reason to, to think that way. You know, coaches, if they don't win to a certain level, and I know that the current athletic director is not going to, you know, he's not going to be patient. No. You know, he's, you know, if they're not, if it doesn't look like they're going in a direction where they're going to win big. And USC is not going to, you know, this is the first time I can say with confidence that this athletic director is not happy with just winning Pac-12 championships. Absolutely. You know, this, this, this athletic director, yeah. So that's a big deal. It's because you can feel that that they're putting the resources back into the football program for the first time in quite a few years. You know, they're hiring coaches. Anyway, I, I forget where we were kind of going with this, but I think the, the, the Clay Clay is is it boils down to right now that players love him. A lot, most of the parents love him. Uh, recruits and their families like Clay Helton think very highly of him. It's just now, you know, if USC does continue to win this year. USC is going to get every recruit they want. So, you know, the, so whatever the fans are thinking, you know, is, is you have to make the fans happy because they're going to go pay the bills and they're going to sit in the stands. But uh, I think, you know, they could win the next six games if they're lucky enough to play six games. We're talking about the Pac-12 championship and then the game after that. And, and I, I wrote something on, on Twitter today with the USC Scoop account that, you know, Clay could win by combined six points the next six games, and he's going to come back next year, and USC is going to be you know, a top five, top ten program. Absolutely. I feel the so, same. It's just really feels bad right now. And if you, but if you go and look at college football games, I'm sure you've watched them and you look at the NFL, the NFL, look at the injuries that these guys are sustaining this year versus uh, other years. You know, they didn't have, they didn't have a spring either. So um, I think I've watched a lot of bad football. And I think it's because it's just a very odd, UCLA and Cal played on Sunday at 9am. You know, that's not normal. No, it's not. <laughs> you know, so, 
And UCLA you know, they actually decided, looked good to say that. Yes, they did. They did. Offensively, I, I think they are really good. Yeah. And that, you know, so that's USC, that final game is going to be interesting to say the least. Yeah. Um, so I, I, you know, I just think fans have never been happy with Clay. And I, and I think until he wins a national championship, they're not going to be happy with Clay. And, you know, winning a national championship is, is clearly not easy. Utah, Colorado, Washington State, UCLA. Do you see those all being wins? I, USC should be the favorite in every one of those games, you know, and, and so, you know, you got a lot of stuff that can happen with, with players getting injured and, and, and whatnot that goes through those. But if I had to bet, if I had to go, somebody put a gun to my head and I had to go bet, I would bet the USC wins their, their remaining games, Pac-12 games. And end up playing Oregon in the Pac-12 championship. Yeah, right. Winner of that gets a, a, a chance to get in this playoffs and see what they Correct. can do. I, you know, and I, I look at it this way. You, you know, this is a year where I think you need that West Coast audience. So if there's a if there's an undefeated Pac-12 team, I I think they'll I think they'll add them to the to the playoff group. I don't know for sure. You know, I hope but, so. I mean, it seems means, like it's going to be strength of schedule and all the teams. Are, yeah, really it's, there's a lot like that's going to go into that. Yeah, because before the season, I heard it's like all the wins have to be decisive blowouts. But do you right. think an undefeated team in the Pac-12 does get into the playoffs? I would bet they do. Okay. Uh, if, it's, if, it's, yeah, I, I, if it's USC or Oregon, which we would anticipate they'd be playing for the Pac-12 championship, um, if those teams are undefeated after those seven games, I think one of those teams goes to the playoffs, yes. Well, you guys, that's Scott Schrader here. Obviously, he is with uscscoop.com. Uh, you guys should follow them. I do. Uh, he has tons of leads. He's Like he said earlier in the episode, he dives into recruiting for multiple sports at USC. Big fan, very passionate about it. Uh, Scott, where all can they find you at? We're at uscscoop.com. That's my that's that's my website. Um, Scott underscore Schrader on Twitter, and and I think it's the same thing on Instagram. Um, so we we put a lot of content up on our website, and we do a lot of, on social media as well. So um, uscscoop.com, but that that's where you can find us. Well, thank you, man. And this is Take Back the West podcast on the Believe Network. Until next time, fight on. Well, there we have it. Uh, great podcast. Thanks, Scott, for coming on and sharing. Uh, what he truly thinks, and obviously this guy has covered the team for a number of years, and you know, he covered me when I was in college. So, you know, thanks, Scott, for coming by. Uh, this team is 2-0. and up. Big game this week. Who we got this week? We got Utah. So Utah has yet to play a game just because of the COVID situation. So hopefully we'll be able to match up versus them. It'll be a great matchup. Kyle Winningham is a great coach. We'll have them fired up to play. They haven't had two weeks of ball. So – We'll see how it happens. Again, this is Frosty Rucker and Take Back the West podcast on the Believe Network. Until next time, fight on.